he's on the watch for the biggest catch of the century. For nearly 30 years, people have scoured the dark, mysterious depths of Scotland's Loch Ness for that elusive creature, the Loch Ness Monster. It was in 1933 that someone first reported seeing something in Loch Ness. Since then, all kinds of people say they've seen it, in varying shapes and sizes. But the Loch still retains its secret, if it has a secret, though many people, like these Cambridge University students, are still convinced that there's a magnificent catch in it. If you're a keen angler, there's just as much suspense and thrill in catching a red-eyed tench or an obliging bream in your local lake or river as there is in hooking the monster. And that's just what these anglers are doing. They're competitors in the annual match between Harrow Waltonians and Hereford anglers. What Isaac Walton called the contemplative man's recreation is now also the contemplative woman's. And it was a woman who wrote the first ever book on angling nearly 500 years ago. business executive escaping from his worries, the office boy escaping from his boss, the housewife, the businesswoman, the writer and the butcher are only a few of the many kinds of people among the two million anglers in Britain today. In coarse fishing, as this kind is called, it's usual to replace the fish after the weigh in and always with wet hands, for dry ones would damage the fish. In return for this consideration, a well-trained fish may be relied upon to give himself up, and some have been caught two or three times. They don't seem to want to get away. Fishing with fly on the Highland Spay, Britain's fastest flowing river, is a different kettle of fish. The fisherman in midstream uses a wading stick, known as the angler's third leg. For one false step could drop him into a hole 30 feet deep. Part of the art lies in selecting the right fly, but a very great deal is in the casting. After about a year in his native river, the salmon goes out to sea for up to four years, travels thousands of miles and returns always to the original river where a reception committee of eager salmon fishermen awaits him. Many an epic struggle between the art of the angler and the artfulness of the salmon has been fought here since the famous engineer Telford caught the first salmon during a dinner break, 150 years ago, while building this, his very first iron bridge. The hydroelectric scheme, which brings light to the remote crofts, also brings problems to the salmon and trout. The six hydroelectric plants, like this one at Pitlochry, have meant just one damn thing after another. So, to help them on their way upstream, fish stairways, something like canal locks, have been built. Supplying the demands of anglers here and abroad requires a pretty large industry, and one in which modern machinery combines with traditional craftsmanship. Here, they're making spit cane rods. The rods are finished in the whipping room. Meanwhile, the lines are being wound, dehanked, or spun. And then the flies are made. And they make them, believe it or not, with peacock's feathers. Flies must look so much like the real thing that they completely fool the trout. These are called swan's wing, yellow cardinal, scarlet tail, and Canadian streamer. But one of the most important things for putting a catch into angling is the hook. 200 million a year are made at this Redditch factory. Here it's a case of roll in the barrel, for the hooks are polished by elm dust rubbed off the insides of these barrels by the hooks. Whether you want to catch a tiddler or a tiger shark, there's a hook specially made for the job. That one at the bottom might do for the Loch Ness Monster. 
carp fishermen, this one is using a potato for bait, know the importance of line and hook. For this king of the fighting fish will ignore a line he can see and break one he can't. Until fishing tackle was modernised, it was almost impossible to catch a carp. Suspense, a bite, a fight. Then finally, victory. Eleven and a half pounds of mirror carp is gaffed at a lakeside in Bedfordshire. Anglers and fish alike face one common enemy, pollution, which has turned fast-flowing salmon and trout rivers into graveyards for fish. The latest of the pollution headaches is that caused by detergent foam, especially after Monday wash day. This is a beautiful Stratford-on-Avon, not a bubble's glow from Shakespeare's birthplace. Industry and government departments are now coming to grips with the great problem of pollution. The Anglers Cooperative Association has fought for regulations to keep water pure in rented fishing areas or on private land but a lot remains to be done before miles of Britain's rivers are clean again. These boats are not icebreakers in the Antarctic, but barges ploughing through the foam at Burton-on-Trent, where a canoe regatta had to be abandoned because the canoeists could hardly see one another. Back in the clear waters of Loch Ness, they're still waiting patiently for the biggest catch of all. The catch that so far has always been the one that got away. For to every angler everywhere, the most fascinating fish is the one still to be caught. <laughs> 